Cliff Kingsbury goes from the Raiders to the Commanders. Here he is yesterday meeting with the media on the type of quarterback he's looking for and also his time working with the presumptive number one overall pick in this year's draft, former USC quarterback Caleb Williams. Here it is. Uh, the Chiefs quarterback? That'd help. Uh, no. Um, I do think the game, as you can see, you watch those guys, Brock and him at the end, like when the money's on the table, you got to be able to make some plays um, with your feet, move around enough to escape a bad play. And it doesn't mean you got to run like Lamar or Kyler Murray, but you better be able to move a little bit and um, buy yourself some time because the, the D-line, the rushes, the defense these days are so good. And, and then the intangibles, you know, you want that – player to be the hardest worker on your team you want him to lead those guys um each and every day when when he shows up in the building you want him to lift the building up and um that's why those guys make the type of money they do yeah he's a great kid there's no doubt and, and like i mentioned earlier just getting to watch lincoln um from afar and, and observe him and, and how he coaches and how he schemes things up and his processes was huge and, and then just being around the younger players and really diving back into the everyday teaching sometimes when you're a head coach you, you step back from the one-on-ones um a little bit and and this allowed me to get back into that vein i'm seeing here that oh first of all before i say that it's a shame if sam howell doesn't get a chance to at least compete. And I don't know why they would move on from him. He's in the third year of a slotted rookie contract. Fifth round pick, I believe he was. Fifth or fourth. Mm-hmm. I think it was fifth. Like, they're not paying a lot of money for him to be on the roster. I hope he gets a chance to compete. Because a lot of the stuff that Cliff Kingsbury was saying, Sam Howell did it last year. Do you just give up on the guy? Because he was part of a team that overall underachieved as he was thrust into the fray as a starter for the first time ever, a team that was transitioning from the tremendous level of dysfunction under Dan Snyder into a post-Dan Snyder existence. What did we expect? I mean, he stayed healthy. He got banged around all year long, got hit, got sacked. He's able to use his feet to buy time. They just need a better offensive line. They need a better team. He might be the guy that, that Cliff Kingsbury and Dan Quinn are looking for. So... You know, sometimes change just for the sake of change because we got to wash away, we got to cleanse the palate from the last team. You know, you end up with the guy we're going to talk about in a few minutes, a Geno Smith, who gets exiled to being a backup before he should have been. And hopefully people learn that lesson. And if Sam Howell does get thrown overboard by the commanders, he gets a chance somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, Sam Howell has some stuff to him. I mean, I think that there are traits there, but I also think that when you get sacked as much as he did, you know, it's not necessarily just offensive line. A lot of that is on the QB. And so it becomes a balance of can the QB use his feet to do good things or is the QB just using his feet to buy time, buy time, buy time. Oh, no. Uh, 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 and then he gets sacked. Like, that's I, I think that's kind of what the difference is. And it's not like you know, he's a veteran. So there are things where you can say, all right, yeah, let's let's train you up a little bit more. Let's make sure you're seeing the game the right way. La la la. But I think part of it, too, is. Toward the end of the season with the commanders, Jacoby Brissett comes in and the offense like blooms, right? You can see that it it takes off in a way that makes it look like, wow, Sam Howell might have been holding things back. So those are the factors that I think come into play there. We we're talking about why Sam Howell is just, you know, not necessarily a part of that discussion. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I also remember what I saw, you know? Yeah, it's a good point. Good point. Won't dispute that, but... Sam Howell still at a point from a financial standpoint where they could keep him around and yes, let him definitely. develop. He hasn't developed yet. Definitely. And he's developing in a different way than we see other quarterbacks develop. Getting thrown into the fray, and I'm a firm believer in getting thrown into the fray if you're like a first or a second round pick. Cause because my, my point always is if you don't think this guy's ready to be thrown into the fray, don't draft him don't with a first him. round pick, especially a high first round pick. Don't pick him. With Howell, I think it was different because of everything that was going on. And, yeah, Brissett, a more tenured, experienced, underrated option. And between the two, far more likely Sam Howell will be back because of the financial aspect than Jacoby Brissett. I did not know when I made the comment about the high-profile member of the Raiders organization saying it's kind of hard to compete with Magic Johnson that Cliff Kingsbury was asked about that yesterday. I see that right here in our rundown. He would Mm -hmm. not comment on what happened with the Raiders and Magic Johnson's involvement in getting him to D.C. Now, this may be a situation where 
Kingsbury's representation was saying one thing, but the reality was something else because the notion was the talks broke down, that they couldn't finalize the deal. And look, in the NFL, anywhere, anywhere that you do business in written contracts, nothing is done until it is done. It's always risky to have verbal agreements that are not honored because it is a small universe and you start pissing people off when you think something is done. You got to do business with those people in the future and that's problematic. But we have seen time and again examples of nothing is done until it's done. I think of the failed effort to trade A.J. McCarron from the Bengals to the Browns several years ago Mm -hmm. and how upset the Bengals were because the deal wasn't done. Well, there's a procedure. Both keys have to be put in and turned. You have to say the magic words. You have to communicate the information to the league office the right way. There was a, a failed effort years ago. Draft day trade between the Bears and the Ravens. And the Ravens were pissed off because they had the deal and the Bears didn't get their side of it called into the league office. So they didn't have a deal. There are procedural requirements. When you're talking about something like this, until Cliff Kingsbury scribbles his name at the bottom of a document, it's not done. If Magic Johnson got involved, all's fair. (laughs) That might cause problems for Cliff Kingsbury in the future. That might cause mm. problems for his agent in the future in a small shop. Mm. But yeah. the fact that he wouldn't comment on it, like, if, if you won't comment on something like that, you got nothing good to say. True. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's like when Josh McDaniels was supposed to become the Colts coach, right? And, you know, they Even announced better example. that he had, Yeah, they announced that he had agreed to become the Colts coach. And then he wasn't the Colts coach anymore, right? And they ended up having to hire Frank Reich or Reich if you are David Tepper. Um, so that, you know, we can say whether or not that worked out. But yeah, that's one of those examples of it's really not done until it's actually done, even if it's a coach. Yeah. David Tepper had a little, a little caviar caught in his throat when he, when he said Reich. That was why that uh... – anyway. Um, the commanders do have the second overall pick. And – Caleb Williams is out there. He's been very quiet on the Caleb Williams front. Yes. Last summer, as they were, and I still haven't, I don't, I should know this. I don't know which agent is representing him. That's going to be a fairly key, important piece of the Caleb Williams experience pre-draft. But last summer, when there were negotiations with agents and there were just preliminary talks about what Caleb is looking for, I had heard through the agent grapevine that, you know, there was a lot of stuff that Caleb Williams was looking for, including equity in the team, and his camp didn't quite understand. As they were talking to the agents, you can't really get that. You can't really do that. And it was about that time the league passed the rule that no equity to any employee, no players, no coaches, we're not going to give equity to any employees of the teams. And that all kind of came together at the same time. And people still like, Oh, you made this up about, I'm not making this. Why why would I make that up? Like, if I'm going to make stuff up, I'm going to make up far more interesting stuff than Caleb Williams' (laughs) dad telling agents he's interested in having a piece of equity in the team before Caleb Williams and his dad realize it's not possible. So that's all that was. But the point is this. The kids got power and the kids got leverage. And I do two spots a week on the score in Chicago, and obviously they are even more taken with the Justin Fields versus Caleb Williams question than anyone else in the country. And they're obsessed with it as they should be because we're all in a holding pattern as we wait to see how this is going to play out. We're reading the book with blank pages there. There's nothing to read until you get to the end, but they're stuck on the blank pages because you can't get to the end until it reveals itself through the normal process. A terrible one book. thing I said a couple of weeks ago, and I hadn't yeah, it's a terrible book, all blank pages. I mean, what the <laughs> hell? Um, but uh, but anyway, um, if Caleb Williams wants to go play for the commanders, there are ways he can send that message without stepping into the spotlight of scrutiny and hatred and animosity that you and I both know most fans will heap upon him. Because it is an honor and a privilege to be drafted. 
It is an honor and a privilege. Boy, if only the government could have pulled that off with military service, they never would have had an issue in the 60s. It's an honor and a privilege to be drafted. It's not. It's not. First time. Hey, I don't know if you had February 16 on your bingo yeah. card, but yeah, yeah, it's not an honor and a privilege. It's That's bull crap. Caleb Williams should be allowed to pick who he's going to play for. Every player coming out into the draft should have the same freedom that he had to pick a college. Now, you sign a contract, you don't have the same freedom to transfer from college to college. It's a different issue. That's where the metaphor falls apart. But they should have the ability to pick the first team with whom they sign a contract. And I think back to 2012, there was some stuff going on behind the scenes with Robert Griffin III and Andrew Luck. And Andrew Luck was regarded as the clear-cut better guy. But I remember guys like Tony Dungy saying, I'd take RG3. And RG3... If he wanted to, he could have made it more interesting for the Colts, but he didn't want to play for the Colts. He wanted to play for Washington for a variety of reasons. So when the Colts invited him to go visit, he just didn't. Yeah, I'm not. No, no, thank you. I'm not going. So you pick up the vibe that the guy didn't want to be here. There's a way for Caleb Williams to send out the vibe. He doesn't want to play for the Bears. If he doesn't, this is all premise. Bears fans, don't, don't, don't get all riled up yet. I'm just saying. Big if. If this guy yeah. wants to play for Kingsbury, if he mm. wants to play for Washington, if he wants to play his home games in the worst stadium in America, if he wants to do all those things, there's a way to try to make make it clear to the Bears that he just doesn't want to be there. And for the same reasons, Miles, that I say that a no-trade clause is irrelevant in a franchise quarterback's contract because – no team is going to trade for a franchise quarterback that doesn't want to be on that team. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a guy who supposedly is generational talent and is going to be the first franchise quarterback in Chicago since Sid freaking Luckman. If he doesn't want to be there, that's something the Bears need to take into account. And then the question becomes, how big of a fight do the Bears want to pick with him publicly? Or do they just, do they just begin to leak that as they take a closer look at the film and get to know the players? You know, Drake May and Jaden Daniels. We, we underestimated them. That's their way to ease away from Caleb Williams. And I say all that because we're thinking about trade, trade, trade. Two to one, one to two, Bears to Commanders. If he wants to go to Commanders, you know, they may not even have to trade. There's a way to pull this off if, if he truly wants to be reunited with Cliff Kingsbury. It's not only contingent on a flip-flop of the first and second pick in the draft. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there are multiple ways that that could end up happening, but I, I think that it, it goes back to what you started with, right? What is the bears evaluation of Caleb Williams and are they willing to say, yeah, we don't necessarily think that he's going to be the franchise guy that we, that he is presumably going to be. And then off of that is Caleb Williams looking at the bears organization saying, mm, I don't know if that's actually the right place for me. I mean, it, it's, as you said, it's not necessarily uh, a, a, a process where you get to choose. So even if Caleb Williams comes up with that kind of evaluation, if the bears are like, I'm picking you anyway, then they're going to pick him anyway. Um, but I think it would behoove everybody if it's a copacetic situation where you're saying, all right, I want to be there and you want me there. And you know, it's kumbaya in that way. And if it's the bears, great. If it doesn't end up being the bears, then, you know, a, are you going to trade that number one overall pick, which I think would make some sense, right? If that's the way they would go. If, if they don't think that Caleb Williams is going to be the guy, they being the bears, then if the commanders think that great, I mean, you go down from one to two, but then, are you then say, okay, is it going to be Drake May? Is it Daniels? No. If we're going to keep Justin Fields, then we go down from two to whatever, and then we potentially pick up even more draft picks. So that's why, you know, as you said, like it's a terrible book with blank pages, but that's the kind of evaluation that the Bears have to be going through right now that's going to go not, you know, until it doesn't, right? Whether they trade the first uh, number one overall pick or not, and we end up, I don't know when the draft is, April 28th, whatever the hell it is, and they end up picking – or they may potentially trade it before as they did last year. And, you know, the Panthers end up getting uh, Bryce Young at number one overall. I remember last year the Bears fell all the way to number nine in that trade with the Panthers. But at one point, 
during the season, David Tepper alluded to the reality, as it was reported by some at the time, that initially the Bears were going to flip-flop with the Texans, one and two, and then the Bears potentially were going to move again from there, but the Bears decided not to make it that complicated because there's this belief that if the Texans, and this was all part of the effort to justify picking Bryce Young over C.J. Stroud, the point David Uh Tepper was trying to make, and he didn't do a very good job of making it, not because he threw a drink on somebody while he was trying to do so. He just wasn't getting his words out the right way. The point was, if it would have happened... Bears, Texans, flip-flop, Texans would have taken Bryce Young, and then if the Bears and the Panthers had done a deal for two and nine flip-flop, the Panthers would have had C.J. Stroud. So it was all part of this effort to say everybody wanted Bryce Young. Everybody thought Bryce Young was going to be the guy. Everybody. It wasn't just me deciding – with no skill or ability or experience or insight in evaluating football players that I wanted Bryce Young. It wasn't just me. It was everybody else. It was all the people who worked for me, who knew it was good for them to agree with me, and it was people who don't work for me as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of ways this can go. But my overriding point is this. We saw Mm -hmm. it with John Elway in 83. We saw it with Eli Manning in 2004. And I'm trying to get people to understand this. Think about it. If this was your son, your brother, your cousin, your nephew, your friend, your client, anybody you care about as more than just a robot that puts on whatever helmet is issued to him and goes out and plays, they have power. And it rarely gets used. And there are subtle ways to exert the power. And if you try the subtle ways and the attitude from the Bears is it doesn't matter, we're still picking you. The question then becomes, at what point do you try a not subtle way? At what Mm -hmm. point do you have the nerve, the courage, the audacity, as some would say, to tell the world, I don't want to play for the Bears? And Eli Manning was lucky because he had a dad who was very well known, who had played in the NFL, who was the one who provided the voice to it, Mm -hmm. even though it was Eli who didn't want to go to the Chargers. Right. Eli got criticized less than he would have because Archie's the one that took the heat for it publicly, and anyone out there would do that for their son. Archie was in a position that people would listen, and it would be covered, and it would be written about. So just something to keep an eye on. Because it's not as clean and simple as just trade, trade, trade. It could be that Caleb Williams tries to get the Bears to not. And that's the other side of it, too. Or the Bears are going to trade the pick to somebody. What if so, somebody wants to trade up to get Caleb Williams? You better be damn sure Caleb Williams wants to play for you before you make that trade. That would be the worst outcome. We have the first overall pick, and we're going to take Caleb Williams. Hey, Caleb, we got some good news for you. We have the first pick in the draft. Oh, uh, I got some bad news for you. <laughs> So anybody that's thinking about trading up to number one, part of your due diligence is make damn sure the guy wants to play for you because, you know, I, I just – I want someone to be the first one. I want someone – because I th- just think it's the right thing to do. Somebody needs to break this mold and get us all out of this fever dream that it's an honor and a privilege to be told where you're going to start your NFL career. It should not be. It should be a choice that's made by the player. All right. Yeah, but that, now, I mean, think I of the criticism Gino's, that would be ahead, levied. Sorry, I, just the thing of the criticisms that would not be levied here, on the not person here. who does that. Yeah, I know, I know, but I know. I, I'm saying by the Bring world it. at large, man. Like that's not. I know that's a that's I'll, a tough battle to to wage. You know, I'll this, fight this them all. Somebody, I'll fight them all, <laughs> and I fight dirty. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the player. <laughs> that's not. I know, you know that, but I'll on that's the nice. ball battle. But I'll tell you right now, on behalf of whatever player it is, I will fight like hell against anyone that criticizes him. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.